Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. So let's give everyone five minutes, two to five minutes, and then we can get started. Good morning, Socket. Hey, Dan. <laughs> How's it going? Good, good, thank you. Yourself? Doing good. It's getting busier and busier now as the year is progressing. That agenda doc, by the way, should be editable um, socket. Okay. Can you edit it? Can you edit it? Um, I, th I, I said it that way, but uh, I don't know if some of the permissions mm. were rolling down. Yeah. Mm, let me check. No, let me send a request to edit access. Okay. Got to set that up. So you can. I just sent that out for you. So, yeah. Okay. Or it should be. I, mean, I sent it to your OCP address. Um, are you logged in on your OCP or under your meta? Oh, send I'll, I'll okay. send it to both. I'll send it to both, actually. It doesn't okay. really matter. Should get that on the bow. Mm -hmm. Yep. I do have edit access now. Okay. Jabari is having some audio issues, so he's going to reboot and join. Mm -hmm. How's everyone on the call doing? Anything exciting? Anything new? Anything interesting going on? I was trying to figure out who is there anybody else on this call going to Lisbon? The OCP event in Lisbon? Not me. Um, <laughs> Nor I. Oh, okay. I was trying to figure out where to stay. Like, I was trying to figure out where is the event, and I am terrified i'm gonna choose the wrong place to stay <laughs> <laughs> so i was like oh uh, anyway we can okay. certainly check with like where others are living yeah. like uh, in, uh yeah. Yeah. and then yeah. probably uh, provide you recommendations yeah i don't even know where it's being i was gonna have to go like hunt down where it's at like the ocp event is where it's at and then maybe i can like mm -hmm. you know figure it out so no i was just wondering if anybody <laughs> <laughs> uh, allison I, I may be there by the way i just uh, have to get a pool <laughs> awesome i'm excited i've never been to portugal so ooh, how fun no nor have i i know Hopefully. sounds fun anyway just thanks thanks though if anybody is shoot me a, a, a text i'm gonna go try to find out actually where the event is so uh let's see Mm 
All right, it's five past eight. Uh, so maybe we can get started. So I'll share the agenda. I'll share my screen uh, to go over the agenda for today's meeting. So today I'll uh, I'm I'll try and lead. This is my first time, so bear with me. I'm gonna try and lead, and then John is gonna fill in as required, and then um, we'll take it from there. So welcome everyone for today's call. Um, so just a follow up for last meeting. Um, uh, as we discussed, we are looking for a third co-lead position for ACF and those discussions are still in progress. Hopefully soon we'll have an update uh, for the group over here. Um, and then uh, we can, for as uh, we formalize uh, the third uh, position. The second topic that was discussed last time was possible uh, move to uh, DCP, OCP under a, a data center facility track. So those, again, uh, it's, it's still been discussed. Uh, I think that, that will take some time because we'll get better alliance between um, the DCP, or, uh, the data center facility leadership, like steering committee and uh, cooling environments uh, leadership. Uh, so once we get that, uh, will probably uh, decide like where uh, where we move. Again, the idea over here is if we can leverage the audience from data center facility, then uh, we can get better interaction, more interaction. And um, since both of them are, uh, agenda for both of groups are like very aligned. I think so it does make sense to move under that um, governance but nonetheless until that happens i think so uh, we should progress as we've been doing so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it does uh, i agree i mean i think the engineering involvement alone is uh, is probably worth it right mm -hmm. um, from the uh, from an attendance perspective so yeah thank you yeah the third one is the bim effort so the work stream and then bim effort um Again, uh, we have not seen any progress, uh, mm -hmm. very limited engagement in that effort. Uh, so uh, I would like to open the floor for discussion on how as a group we can make some progress, uh, what is limiting, what needs to be done, or you know, what are the next steps uh, in, in that kind of efforts. So we can take some concrete decisions and um, make some progress over there. Um, so any ideas from the group or what challenges uh, does the group see? Do we have the work stream leaders for BIM? We don't have a, uh, a proper work stream now. Okay. So maybe uh, what we can do is like we can have, uh, if, if someone wants to volunteer that work stream effort, like, uh, and then start organizing it, uh, that's probably we can get some traction for that work stream. Yeah, that and by the way, I'm just going to mention that effort would be to um, kind of research and tie into what is required for OCP ready and make sure that the BIM models are appropriate to tie into that and can be approved as OC re OCP ready, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, anybody uh, on the call, if interested, please reach out to uh, John and myself, and then we can take it from there. Um, or we can also discuss it uh, right now if, if anyone is interested. Uh, would, would it make sense to um, maybe partner with a DCF, um, one uh, of their um, work streams, to? Are you all hearing me? Sorry. No, no, Jabari, please. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Maybe partner with DCF or um, over the BIM efforts of the CDU wiki, um, or or with the wood stream that um is being kicked off with um Don Don Mitchell, um, mm -hmm. just maybe kind of partner with him and kind of tack these these efforts on onto the end of those um or or, or work them in somehow to have the participation. Um, and then maybe once we have something developed, um, in that way, we could then come back to this group and expand on it. You understand what I mean? Um, instead of starting from scratch here, we, you know, um, advance the effort within the context of another, um, work stream. And that way we can actually have something launched that we can work off of. Yeah. But I, I don't know if it makes sense, right? Um, it's, 
Yeah. No, that is a good idea. Uh, definitely, we can try that. Uh, you know, we we can also look at like what's uh, ongoing with the DCF uh, uh, site, and then see if we can leverage that. I, th I think that is a good suggestion. I work. think Socket knows who leads that. Again, so. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, DCF is also uh, you know Brett was involved quite a bit, uh, but he, you know uh, he he decided to step down because of her because of his other commitments. So, but yeah, I'll I'll try to bridge the gap over there between the two work streams, and then we'll find someone. Mm -hmm. Um. So on the CDU also, um, we are looking for a new leader for the work stream. So uh, we can, I can definitely reach out within Meta. I think so. I know a couple of names who can sir, definitely be. Sir, uh, can I, uh, can I ask a favor? Sure. Uh, I've been trying to volunteer for this spot for a while, but um, huh. what, what comes out is I don't know enough about how the internals of OCP work. How do I get a meeting scheduled? How do I contact the, the people who want to be on the team? I've got several people who want to be on that team. Um, I just, I'm not an insider in OCP and I, I just, uh, I, I need some help. I'd be happy to to continue to work in that group and lead it. Um, and there are several people who who have some ideas that they want to, to bring forward. Mm -hmm. um, so up, there's a process and if I could maybe offline, you know, out of here, uh, if someone could work with me a little bit to, to get that started. If I, I don't know how to get a, meeting on the calendar for that work group, for example. Just minor little things, but uh if 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 I'm on the outside, I I just I'm not I'm not succeeding in getting anything done. But I'd be happy to put in the work there. I can help with that, uh Jack. In fact, um I have the document started. Um I will also say that uh my company Vertiv just acquired a company that makes CDUs. Yeah, And um, while they are a little, um, I would say, overwhelmed right now with being bought and integrating into a, another company, um, we have some great resources there, too. So I'm thinking next quarter, we should have some pretty good involvement from them as well. That would be great. I, I also am working with some people who are making some CDUs and, and some people, some other vendors who have a deep interest in how CDUs are applied to their equipment. Um, as well as I'm working with the uh, heat reuse group. Um, so it, I have a lot of people who want to get tied together with this. Uh, so if I could get some help on how the mechanics work, um, I, th I think I can help us get something done really quickly. Okay. Thanks very much, John. Yep, thank you. Um, how do I see uh, the participants call also? So that I know who's talking uh, while I'm sharing the screen. Oh, um, so uh, if you go, if, when you're the uh, leading it, if you go to the top, sorry. you'll um, there'll be a. I'm sorry, the very bottom there's a participants. Click on the participants, and it'll mm. put up a sidebar which you can push off your. If you have another monitor, you can put it on that, for example. Oh, okay. Got it. That one was me, Sika. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Jack, yeah. I was, yeah. I was going to ask, like, I'm sorry. I, I'm not sure I'm, who I'm talking to. Uh, so I was going to ask you, but um, okay. Now I know. I have the screen over here. I got it. Great. So, uh, yeah, this layout is uh, somewhat different than what we use internally at Zoom. But uh, Jack, thanks for that. Uh, definitely, uh, we'll reach out to you and then uh, we can definitely help you get this uh, started. And then uh, while we are talking on the wiki, I think so there is need to update our wiki also to better represent uh, so that we can um, look at the previous like meeting minutes and all the recordings as well. Uh, so I'll take a stab at it. I'll start updating our wiki and then our next in our next meeting, probably we can discuss that uh, not just CDU, but like overall our uh, ACF uh, wiki and, uh, and then update what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could also help with the CDU side of things. Um, coming from uh, Motive Air, you know, I was uh, key in some of the R and D installations, operations, programming, and um, a whole slew of things behind the their particular CDU. So, you know, I've got a a few years of of that side of it under my belt. 
and uh, be happy to uh, assist. Is that Ben Graham? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, great. I will. Uh, I'll put you on this. I'm putting that in the notes that you're going to work with. Uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, this was like so, uh, some of the continuation from the last meeting uh, that we have followed up. Uh, any questions so far from the group? If not, then uh, we can move on uh, to the next, like uh, the new business, like what we would like to discuss this. Um, Jabari, I think so you are... Uh, uh, attending the conference. So um, I would definitely love to get an update for your work stream. Um, attending the regional conference you're talking about? Um, Jabari. Uh, is, that, is that something else? Yeah, I'm on another topic. I'm not. Sorry, you said I was attending the conference. Oh, anyway. Um, I wasn't sure if this was connected to the regional conference. Um, but anyway, in terms of the concurrent maintainability group stream, um, yeah, so re originally we wanted to have everything, have everything wrapped up by um, the 5th of January. Um, but like the note says, a lot of people had, uh, they were unavailable because of heavy travel schedule. Um, so of the remaining sections that are still being developed, um, well, one was completed on January 18th, which is there, but it's the ones that are still being developed are the discussion of the facility IT boundaries, um, the concurrently maintainable piping distribution. Uh, that was just a separate section would have, that would have come out about the discussions that we were having in preparation for the OCP summit. And then um, considerations of mixed use environments where um, you still have you know, traditional um, air cooled facilities as well as um, liquid cooled facilities and how you can achieve concurrent maintainability in, in that kind of setting. Um, so those three sections are still being worked on. Um, and as I said, the latest section completed was um, comparing a, a brief comparison of air cooled with a liquid cooled um, concurrent maintainability consideration. And that was on the 18th of January. So um, I'm working with everyone to try to progress this as, as scheduled submit. Um, my schedule as, as well is pretty hectic, um, but uh, we continue to try to have this um, done as people uh, are available. And in terms of the call, we pause um, to kind of focus on the on the white paper because the calls were taking place um, with the assumption that we would talk about what was completed and have them try to you know uh, live edit as it will have um, ongoing feedback. Um, but we will wait until these sections are completed, then uh, we will meet as required to do um, the work stream reviews, and then we'll proceed to the regular process of um, expanding it for um, leadership review, et cetera, once that is done. Jabari, yeah. um, do you have, um, as part of the, um, the work output there, any um, drawings that are in you know whatever format that are that we could use for reference designs either directly that in terms of they are created in Revit or they are a, um, a schematic or a graph you created that we could craft into a Revit model that show um, concurrent maintain uh, concurrent maintainable piping um, you know ideas concepts or a full design. So originally we had never met um, met to, it was never meant to you know, the work stream itself. Um, we were we weren't aiming to have a how do you say prescriptive um, mm -hmm. uh, descriptions of design. So we would have had some sample um, schematics in the discussion of the facility ID boundaries, uh, but that does those, those would have been very generic. Um, at no point in the document would we have. Uh, a recommendation of how to lay these things out. Uh, and, and the reason for that, besides not wanting to be prescriptive, is, you know, we, well, one, you would have a lot of variation in terms of um, the specific, the specific of, of different facilities, but we did have uptime um, as a partner on this. 
and they are the ones who kind of decide or determine what is concurrent maintainable, what, what is concurrently maintainable in terms of tier standards. And um, that is something, an effort that is a bit larger than the workstream itself. Um, we would need guidance from uptime in terms of a, a document that they would produce to have a standard for that. And, and this is something that we had discussed at length in the meeting um, over the past year. Um, if, if this effort was really meant to uh, take the place of an uptime, um, uh, how do you call it, an uptime reference doc, or mm -hmm. if uptime would still maintain responsibility for that. And I think that um, based on the results of the discussion, it was never the intention for us to be that prescriptive. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? They, um, it was that that would have kind of sent the stream in another in a direction that um, was a bit. It would have been a bit too detailed. There would have been a lot of nuance to cover, um, and it would have been it would have required a lot more effort. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Just... I hope I'm not rambling there. I'm just no, I'm no, recalling it's... a lot of the things that we discussed today. Yeah, no, all, all caveats um, notwithstanding. I. I um... I, I get it. I um, I'm just checking. <laughs> it okay. would be a rollout. Of I hope that. I'm not disappointing you. <laughs> no, because no, I, no. I know people want it. They want they, that that guidance um, in terms of how you you, you design a concurrently maintainable mm -hmm. TCS so mm -hmm. a TCS loop is something that the industry needs. Um, mm -hmm. We think that this definitely is a, is a step in that direction. There's a lot of information based on the discussions we have between vendors and owners and operators of data centers. That mm -hmm. would you know, provide a lot of guidance to people who are embarking on that kind of journey for concurrent maintainability. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are still, you know, we, we did have to put um, some boundaries around um, the scope of the white people. So, you know. Got it. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, thanks for the update. And uh, Jabari, probably I'll. Uh... I'll connect with you offline uh, to know more about it. Like this is just uh, like for me to understand more what's going on uh, and uh, understand more about this work stream and like what's what's ongoing. So it's probably I'll, I'll I'll reach out to you separately. Okay. The next one uh, we have is like inlet temperature inquiries. Uh, so John, um, maybe I'll need your help over here. Sure, sure. So. Uh... I put this on here because um, in the last two weeks, I've been asked by several different people uh, from different organizations what they should be designing for an inlet temperature. And, you know, the um, engineer in me <laughs> just says, okay, well, we need to put down a lot of parameters to talk about before we can uh, decide that. But um, that said, if I were to go and... Um, you know, look at the um, the guidance from um, from TC99, and by the way, that's a an active link to that um, to that document. Um, uh, what are people designing for? And is it 30, 32? Yeah, there you go. It's the last page, I believe. If you go to the um, for the for the water classes, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, we've got these numbers on here. And uh, what are people designing for based on the technologies at this point? And um, uh, and I, I don't know why, but I keep getting asked about 30 degrees Celsius. So my my uh, my curiosity is, and that's 86 degrees Fahrenheit, by the way. Um, why is it coming up? Like, was there a a, a conference, a paper put out, something where 30 has been to, uh, or a vendor? That's saying they want thirty degree inlet temperature. So I just figured I'd yeah, ask it of this group. Sorry, there there are some users who are targeting that temperature, uh, who mm -hmm. are building hyperscale centers, and they have decided that that's their correct number. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can add to this. Like Meta is designing for thirty degrees C, um, uh, technical water uh, inlet temperature. I think so. There were a lot of discussions going on. Uh, between different hyperscalers like Microsoft, Google, and like what is the right temperature, mm -hmm. and everyone has um, like some opinion, like uh, higher than thirty or lower than thirty, and then thirty degrees C was somewhere 
it was understood like um, midway, you know, it, it is like more optimized. So internally, we also did some studies uh, to provide 30 degrees C uh, technical water loop. What is the facility water temperature that is required? And then every two degree drop in temperature, your chiller utilization increases quite significantly. So yeah. considering, um, you know, the data locations of data centers, 30 degrees C seem more optimized where you could reduce the number of chiller hours. You can still get, uh, you know, um, 30 degrees C uh, technical water supply temperature uh, without, um, you know, a lot of use of chillers. So that was the driving factor behind that. Um, one thing that was consideration again, like uh, again, coming from chip vendors, we have to see how much runway does 30 degree C gives us in terms of supporting uh, the next generation hardware. But so far we think we might have some, a long runway with 30 degree C, at least like 10 to 12 years we are thinking about. Um, I have a question <clears throat> just because of, out of curiosity, what's the uh, delta that you normally see from that, uh, from inlet to outlet? Uh, 10 degrees C delta. So that's what it's been designed for. Mm -hmm. okay. Technical water loop. Yeah, and I believe it's also at a, a maximum of 2.2 uh, GPM per yeah. node. So... So that's what uh, the 30 degrees C has been, uh, where that number probably I would say is coming from. Is that the right one? I mean, we can definitely discuss about it uh, if, if we think otherwise and then um, and then provide our reasoning for why it should be something different. But I believe like uh, last year, um, it was part, part of the cooling environments group itself, right? Um, there were a lot of discussions going on and uh, it seems like the industry has aligned towards the 30 degree C technical water supply temperature. Okay. And what's the and what's the range of the inlet that that other people were suggesting? It it's was like, from yeah, it was as low as 18 degrees Celsius to uh, 40 degrees Celsius. 40 was the highest. Okay. So. Um, the reason why I was kind of the reason why I was asking is, um, can you, um, cascade the technical water loop where it starts off at 18 and ends up at 40 and have, and have different CDUs set up or for that, you know what I mean? Yeah, we could do that way, uh, if there is need. And and yeah, I mean, I, I don't see why it it can't be done that uh, way. Uh, Brian, I'll I'll add that um, while I think we try to avoid getting a very high delta T across the chiller for the you know for the times when the chiller is being used. Yeah, um, if you do cascade and you get a very high delta T, it does present the opportunity of doing something like a you know take um, an inline dry cooler or something that's doing some pre cooling before it goes to the uh, the compressor to, to reduce that a little bit. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, I think I think when you go into cascading like that, it makes sense to to look also with their heat rejection as you know modular as well. Yep. Yeah. And and I think that this would be a good uh topic for the CDU work stream also, right? Like uh because essentially that's how the CDU I mean some of the factors you want to design for is like the approach temperatures and all those things. So that will dictate what kind of chiller uh, you want and the capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good discussion. Uh, thanks for bringing that topic up, John. And then likewise with the, the CDU or um, uh, bypass characteristics allowing for uh, mixing uh, before returning back into that return portion of that loop um, mm -hmm. is also a, a, a nice way to, to damper some of that uh, extremely higher delta T's. Um, hmm. yeah. you know, uh, because, because of the CDU itself isn't going to 
uh, require a hundred percent flow through the heat exchanger, it, it's going to modulate, you know, and vary all the way, you know, from who knows, 10% to a hundred percent of capacity, depending on the, uh, the jobs run on the, uh, the IT. Um, so you'll, you'll, uh, want to tend to utilize, um, some of that mixing characteristic of, yeah. um, possibly utilizing a, a three-way valve or a bypass. Right. So again, there are different ways uh, on how you can uh, do it. And it, it again depends on like what's the, how the system is set up, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like yep. what we are looking into is like uh, trying to optimize the maximum delta T across the chiller. So the chillers can be utilized efficiently. So in that case, like we are uh, mainly modulating the flow on the primary side versus modulating the flow. So we don't want actually mixing because in case of uh, low load, that might just like dilute uh, mm -hmm. the delta T. So again, and it depends on how the system is set up. Uh, yeah, so. yeah and, and that also raises the point of when we're designing systems like this, we want to have a an extended loop time, meaning we want to have at least five minutes of, of loop time before it gets back to the chiller. Mm -hmm. So we're not short cycling the chillers as well. Uh, on that point, by the way, that that by the way is some of what I've been hearing on the thirty degree um, is the uh, because of the short cycle. Well, two things: short cycling, but also um, loss a loss condition. You lose a um, you lose some power. Uh, what's the ride through? So while I had seen thirty five and even forty uh, pretty commonly as supply temperatures. I'm I'm seeing 30 more, and one of the rationales I've heard is that you know it gives you more headroom, right? And so you're not bumping into that the high temp condition. Uh, makes sense. Yes, indeed. Uh, I also add that one of the ways to to achieve that is uh, uh, with uh, buffer tanks, right? So you can have re return buffers, you can have supply buffers. Those will help with keeping your your short cycling. Um, because we do that as well uh, at Vertiv. If we have a bunch of uh, our smaller chillers in parallel and we want to reduce that, we'll put uh, some buffers there. Yeah, it definitely helps increase the, the uh, longevity of the equipment, uh, wear and tear and things like that. So, yeah. yeah. And, and it also helps provide a, a more constant loop temperature. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, anecdotal story here. I, I used to cover Manhattan and um, there are uh, labor um, restrictions, you know, based on the unions in uh, New York City area. So there are quite a few data centers in Manhattan that don't have buffer tanks per se, because if you have a buffer tank over, or if you have a tank, I should say, over a certain amount of gallons um, of fluid, the um, there's a requirement to have a, 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 building, a building engineer on staff 24-7. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there are in, you know, relatively smaller data centers, there are some 16 inch mains running around the outside of the data center. <laughs> just, just to help increase that volume. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly nice. right. Nice. Yeah. Which are not a tank. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And as well as, you know, having to have them recertified every year um, also plays a role. Um, yep. All right. That's all I, I'm glad. Uh, thank you for that input, by the way, um, for everybody that just weighed in on that. I'm just, I was curious where that 30 was coming from and um, it's good to hear it talked out a little bit. So thank you. Back to you, Socket. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> so the next line item that I have is a request for all uh, the initiatives that we are doing and what are the goals that uh, as a group we should target, you know, by end of 2024, I've, uh, you know, what all white papers or what all contributions we are looking. Um, as I, I think so I mentioned this in the last meeting as well, like it would be good to have uh, something that, uh, it would be good to list out what our deliverables, our target deliverables for 2024 are so that we can track and then make necessary adjustments to meet those, right? Like, so if we know, uh, what we want to deliver. And if we are making steady progress, then we are good. If not, then we can uh, uh, 
make suitable uh, adjustments to our goals or the methodologies to achieve it. So probably it would be good uh, like for every work stream to list out what we are planning out. And um, maybe that's something we can discuss for uh, next meeting. If anything, if what are the plans for any white papers, guidelines, or anything? Mm -hmm. And even if you're not a writer, um, if you're on the call and you have a uh, a need, you know, something that you feel that we should be covering, please bring that up. And the last one over here we have is discussion of FD83 usage. Uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind bringing that up. I know this is a um, a commercial product and they, they may not be on, Dan Foss or Eaton might not be on the call here, but I, I figured it's worth mentioning this um, because I'm hitting it all the time in my own practice. Um, the FD83 fitting, which is a very nice... Um, um, quick connect with double um, ball valve shutoffs. Um, I, I'm finding it more and more. Clients are coming to me with requests to include it on manifolding, on, on um, different parts of our equipment. Uh, just wanted to mention it. Um, they do make it up now to two inches, uh, which is a fairly recent addition. This was available in one inch uh, for some time, and it gets used I've used it and my and I've I've seen a lot of other installations using it as the final connection point uh between the let's say a rear door heat exchanger or a so, manifold. John. Yes, sir. Don. Real quick. The, uh this is Don. Um uh FD83 is a single product vent or a single vendor product. And Dan Foss has specifically, when I asked them about um promotion of this. Mm -hmm. They said they are not willing to um, share the that as an open solution. They are very proprietary on that. Mm -hmm. So if we are choosing to promote that, Open Compute is promoting a single vendor product just as a footnote. Okay. No, no. It, you know, fair point. Um, I, I wasn't meaning to say we should all use this. I just wanted to share some knowledge, which is that it's available in larger sizes. That's yeah. all. Uh, so, Eaton, Eaton also is offering the same fitting. Um, no, Eaton sure is that. all the fittings, Eaton, uh, Aeroquip, and Danfoss, same yeah. product, same company. It's all, okay. all owned by Danfoss. Yeah. yeah, I wasn't sure how the hierarchy worked in there. I also so, was privy to um, that fitting is going to be coming down the pipe in a... Um, a high temperature plastic version <laughs> instead of the stainless steel. So there there's opportunity in the future to have some, some savings and some weight uh, reduction, um, you know, in the coming year, uh, just a little nugget for you guys. So one of the things, can, uh, can I share something? I don't know if I can. Let me... Yeah. Uh, let me stop uh, sharing. So one of the things we are trying to hold oh, us now, I can't find the little share button anymore because you just moved. <laughs> Here we go. Um, share this. Uh, hopefully that. Are you seeing a screen? Yes. Okay. So what we're seeing here is um, a slide of this work stream that we have on uh, uh, deploying the TCS at scale is looking at three different methodologies that could achieve potentially the same benefit um, without in, in an open fashion. The tri-clamp, the concept of a isolation valve plus a tri-clamp, the concept of an isolation valve plus a groove coupling and the concept of a dripless connector. We avoided the term FD83. Um, and we're looking at, um, you know, what are the trade-offs? One is uh, multiple vendors and global supply, a key aspect ends up being, and um, this is something I'd like to reach out to others, is what is the process that we're using this for, okay? If the process is for disconnecting an IT rack, then we need to define what is that process. And let me take a, foot, a step back. How often are IT racks disconnected? 
All right. Um, no, this is good. This is good information, Don. Uh, and uh, so, is that a you kind of threw out a, a question there? How often? Well, are I, I, well yeah. yes. I, I no. That's, that's a, not not a high, uh, um, a rhetorical question. That's a, a real question because mm -hmm. uh, there are different answers I receive. But generally speaking, how often are we looking to disconnect an IT rack? Yeah, it's very infrequent. Okay, so then the next question ends up being. What's the process for disconnecting an IT rack? And what I generally hear is even with the FD83, you would want to shut off your supply and return. You'd want to do some amount of drainage of your IT rack just to make it lighter. And then you would disconnect it. So if you do that, the question ends up being, is there a connection method that is substantially better if you've already done some amount of draining of your IT rack before you moved, um, before you do disconnect, and if you're doing this once every three to five years, what is the benefit of the FD of a dripless connector? We'll just take FD up of a dripless connector versus an isolation valve and a uh, tri clamp. Uh, it's, it's a it's a valid question. Um, I think. Uh... Uh, we're just going to note it here as as that, um, and uh, we can point to your to your study here, Don. Um, I will say the answer to that question, as far as I'm concerned, um, on the dripless versus maybe not as dripless, is is there a uh, a, a leak detection rope um, or sensor that could be actuated? if you don't have it mostly drip free, right? Um, that might influence my answer. I mean, granted, you could always shut those off or disable them uh, during maintenance, but just uh, just a thought if I was gonna be looking at it operationally. So first off, just personally, yes, I do work for Victolic, but I really don't care about the answer here. We'll put a uh, FD83 on the end of one of our solutions as well, as quickly as we'll put a coupling there, okay? Mm -hmm. sure. The key challenge we look at is the impact to global supply chain when you only have a single vendor could be huge. And we're talking tens of thousands of these, okay? Mm -hmm. So if we drive the industry toward use of a single vendor's product and that mm -hmm. vendor is not available in certain countries, um, then we have a problem. Yep, understood. So that's all that we're trying to do here. And by the way, this is not a study. This is literally, um, well, let me say it's not a study. Um, I am going to be conducting uh, I'm a uh, call tonight with Asia Pacific, getting their input. And one of the key areas I'm focusing on is what can we do to standardize connection to the rack options? And I'm also very interested in getting feedback from the rack vendors, including um, is there a way to um, modify the, uh, the OCP uh, ORV3 rack to make it easier to uh, do this once every three year transition in a, uh, a more uh, safe manner. Is there a simple thing that we could do on the IT rack in terms uh, to make a standardized use of either a tri clamp, roof coupling or dripless, simple. Final uh, thing to your question earlier, um, would you ever be so confident in a dripless connector that you wouldn't try to put some sort of leak connection or collection underneath the, um, uh, if there, if it was hanging right over a, a um, some sort of a, uh, a drip or a, a leak detector <laughs> or some, I, I generally think that no matter how dripless people say it is, if it's over an IT rack, or if it's over a, uh, a, uh, an alarm sensor, I would, my, the process, and this is one area that I would encourage the IT vendors is to come up with the MOP SOP that actually talks about how we're going to connect and disconnect these IT racks every three years or whatever, or if you have to pull them back for maintenance. Anyway, I'll pull back here. I'm, I didn't mean to make this a. Um, yeah. So uh, Don is presenting some stuff from his effort on uh, modular TCS. Um, I should probably put a link in here for that. Um, we'll, we'll do so, Don. And um, but give it back to Socket here because we're at the uh, fifteen minute mark here. Yes. Um, 
So basically, that's all we had uh, for today. We do have some uh, notes taken and action items. Um, are there any topics for next week that the group would like to discuss? Um, then, yes. Uh, if, you, if you don't mind, I, I kind of wanted to piggyback on, on this topic as well, especially um, with, with these fittings and arrangements. Um, on a lot of um, current projects or projects I've seen in the past, uh, there was primarily... Um, top feed liquid cooling uh, compute, um, which leans towards if you do have an issue with disconnect and, and you got to isolate and, and drain down and refill, um, right after that isolation valve, it, it's kind of crucial to have some sort of a, a high point vent um, mm -hmm. where like an FD83 really doesn't allow that um, to transpire in there. You know, you got to add a, you know, some sort of T or, or another uh, well to lead and, and fitting if it's a sanitary. Um, so, you know, it's just something to keep in mind. So, mm. so I actually got a picture here to try to make uh, John like me again. Uh, and so I, I show this. Uh, <laughs> uh, so we have the, the bus bar for LTR, but what I was trying to is illustrate, I think what you're talking about there, Ben, was the concept that many situations you're looking at uh, tapping straight off the top. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so um, I love that topic. I don't want to keep hogging the table here or of the podium, but it, that's exactly what I'd be talking about is if we need to look at an ORV, if, if people fully analyze where the best um, upper and lower connection point is for liquids when we start deploying at tens of thousands, okay, or at least thousands. Um, even minor improvements can be a, a, a major impact in our world. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a valid point. Now, in, in a, uh, just so I can understand this better, that question, um, or uh, it was Ben, right, that was asking? Yes, that is correct. Ben. Uh, yeah, the um, the high point issue. Um, do you think it would be beneficial to? So I mean, there's a couple options when you're in the rack, right? If we're talking a um, an in rack manifold, distribution manifold, or if we're talking a rear door heat exchanger, either one of those connected from the top. If they're connected from the top, then the the, um, the tendency is for those bubbles to want to go up into the overhead distribution. So um, are you saying um, the need for uh, vents at the rack level in addition to the, um, for an overhead situation, in addition to a high point on the overhead manifold as well? Um, yes. Okay. Yeah, so you, you basically, you know, you have a, an isolation yeah. um, valve there. And before you, you open it up to the system, you want to tackle uh, getting as much air out of that uh, that drop to the rack as possible. So you want to, you know, be able to get all that air out. You want to make sure that it's ready to go and, and not send air pockets down to your CDU or, or you know, uh, allow them to get entrained into the uh, the fluid itself, creating micro, micro bubbles and uh, uh, decreasing your heat efficiency or heat exchange efficiency. So, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because, you know, these systems, they don't have air scoops, you know, where no. it would potentially, you know, get those micro bubbles out of the system. So you want to well, do your due diligence, uh, you know, in advance and prevent that from happening. You, you just said something that I'm very glad you did. And um, <laughs> air scoops, right? Um, I think the, the people that do heating systems are very familiar with what you're talking about. We almost never talk about them here. Um, more often than not, what we'd be talking about is auto air vents or boiler vents. Yes. But I um, I think you've you've brought up an interesting point. Should we, uh, or is there a need to, uh, on some systems or not, put um, traditional air scoop devices? And by the way, these are going to have to be, um, you know, a lot of those devices are cast iron. And 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 uh, plated or or painted. Um, I don't know what the kinds of selections look like when they're stainless for uh, for air scoop options. Um, 
And by the way, I mean inline air scoops and also the uh, the larger style um, air separators that you have with, um, um, you know, kind of random fill on the inside, you know, like, mm -hmm. um, you know, those types of things. So uh, does, do you, anybody have experience with those on the secondary side um, of a CDU um, in, a, in a TCS loop at this point? I'm curious. I'd like to, to know. Yeah, I know I played around with some some spiral vents um, mm -hmm. with a um, low lead brass body. Low lead, um, yeah. I, think, I think they were two inches or or less on the, the MPT side of things. But then it also raises a point, hey, you've got threaded fittings and mm -hmm. we've got to deal with, you know, the threads and pipe dope or, or whatever you have on there. Mm -hmm. um, in rare occasions, you know, if you're doing on chip, you know, you've got to have those threaded fittings. Um, I've seen um, uh, a clear epoxy used for uh, sealing those threads, mm -hmm. but you know, it's 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 up for debate and conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, another, another great that you keep bringing up the good good topics. The uh, <laughs> the other one, uh, you know, um, actually, I'm going to add this at the bottom of. Uh, or put it in notes because that's something we should probably pick up. Thread sealant. I know, uh, and Don, you might have done some work here too. I know pipe dope and tape are, you know, against uh, what we want to be doing here um, in general, right? We don't want pipe dope clogging things. We don't want uh, tape to fray and, and make it into this. Uh, but, but the liquid, uh, clear liquid sealants that are thread sealers that are anaerobic, that seal onto there do those present any problems with the types of fluids and the types of systems we are um, talking about here and I guess sorry yeah no please one question i would ask is the nature of the connection method is it something that's going to be disconnected and reconnected in the field or are we talking about threaded connections that are done in fab shops in an inspected controlled environment and I think those are two different approaches. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so banning threads in fab shops, I don't think is productive. I think you can do a thread one time in its life and guarantee it's not going to leak. But expecting that a thread be used as a means of disconnect and reconnect in an operating facility is probably um, something that should be avoided regardless of what kind of sealant you're able to use. That's just a personal opinion, um, but does anyone agree with that? I think that's an interesting and good in, yeah. uh, insight. <laughs> no, it, it makes perfect sense. Um, you know, as well as you know, if you've got a pre-manufactured, say, header, right, and you've got you know those threaded fittings taken care of at the factory, and then your your field connection is maybe, you know, a sanitary tri-clamp or, you know, Victolic or, or what have you, you know, that means of connection is much easier uh, to accomplish and, um, you know, to attach and, and disconnect as, as needed without mm -hmm. uh, the failure effect of a, a thread leak. So. And throwing this back to John, I mean, most of your products come with a thread at the IT rack, for example, uh, correct me um, if I'm wrong. Uh, uh, depends you... on, on the product. Um, so if we're talking about, for example, well, we have a whole range, right? But if I take just the, uh, the two things that we'd be connecting at the end here, our, our manifolds that we're going to be putting in racks are currently designed with sanitary flanges. Um, our rear door heat exchangers are threaded and in the U.S., we very often use a um, an adapter that brings you from um, NPT, which is what everybody's going to find around here, to a BSP a face seal. So we prefer the BSP face seal if we're going to be threaded, Don. Um, but we can we we do provide adapters to get to NPT if if clients can't source anything that's a BSPP. But to, to the point, I'm yeah, and I appreciate that. And I guess the question ends up being, um, would you expect your customers to actually use the thread as being their method of 
uh, connecting or disc reconnecting their IT rack, or would they put some sort of a, a disconnect on their IT rack? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question. I, I mean, on their uh, their door uh, uh, door heat exchanger or whatever. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously, we'd never use a, a threaded connection, it's the disconnect method, unless it was a a system that you could take down completely. Um, so I, I'm not. Uh, so I, I'm not. Outside of the hose at my house, which I've been very poor in success on use of, I've not done a lot of threaded pipe connections uh, in my career. That, uh, but I do respect that. I think in a um, a fab shop, you probably could do a one-time thread connection and find a method and process that would make it a very reliable method. But you would probably want to somehow at the um, your customer is going to want to put in some sort of connection, be it try or groove clamp uh groove coupling or um uh, uh drip free i think we're going back the same direction here but um the other thing i've not really found is too many documents that tell you not to use a pipe thread or pipe dope i mean it's become industry folklore and i've had gcs yell at me because someone told them to rip out all their stuff but i've never outside of lenovo putting it in the, um uh their requirements it, it, is there a document that actually says thou shall not use pipe tape uh, um, on a uh, TCS? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know that it's there yet. Uh, that well, Now, we might be speaking out of turn, though, um, if we look at all the guidance from immersion and um, cold plate and rear door heat exchanger, there might be something in there. Uh, I don't know if anybody on the call can uh, speak to that. But present. my understanding, the other confusing is that it's not a universal requirement. If you're not having microchannel um, uh, filtrate uh, heat exchangers, yep, um, yep. you really don't care. So has the uh, and and I again I am going to defer and say have the uh, the chip uh, the, the the cold plate group does that group have any guidance? On that, I don't. I don't recall reading anything, but I maybe I'm not up to speed on all of their documentation. Oh, I'm pinging them on this. I didn't know if you'd found it. I mean, I uh, I haven't found anything. I am pinging Emily, um, but uh, we'll see what I can get from her. Okay. Yeah, yeah. we should yeah, we with, should cover that. Yeah, yeah, with working with HP Direct, um, you, you hit the nail on the head when it came to you know on chip versus like a rear door heat exchanger. Um, it, it wasn't really discussed when uh, the rear door heat exchangers were were primarily used, but when they're they're transitioning over to the on chip, um, that was I think one of the design characteristics of any equipment or manifolds or, or headers um, to uh, eliminate uh, Teflon dope, um, not dope, but the uh, um, the, the cording and um, mm -hmm. Teflon itself. No, uh, Teflon. Uh, yeah, and, and we'll Teflon. Even we could even extend that, Ben. If you go around the world, I mean, there's a lot of use still of um, heavy packing. Um, it's that uh, oakum, <laughs> you know. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. There are things like that still used pretty commonly in different parts of the world. Yeah, especially well, the, the parallel pipe thread. You know. mm -hmm. So you go forward with this a little bit further. And as soon as you start banning pipe dope, you're also banning uh, carbon steel, um, mm -hmm. uh, because the the same premise applies. The micro channel doesn't work with carbon steel pipes. At least most carbon steel pipes that I know of I contribute in, uh, more than 25 micron uh, corrosion product. Yep. As, so um, you can see where the you could have a perfectly good distribution solution for door heat exchangers. And maybe for some immersion tanks, not every immersion tank is going to, but it won't work for cold plate and mm -hmm. it won't work for door heat exchangers if they're partnered with cold plate. Um, so uh, you got all I'll, that. I'll, I'll add to that. The uh, door heat exchangers today are largely thin, um, I'm sorry, thin and tube constructions, right, Don, you know, um, right. copper and, and aluminum. Um, if you go to compact heat exchanger technology, right, or um, now, granted, the channels are still going to be larger than they are with um, the chip coolers. And the chip coolers, by the way, I mean, we're, we've are we heard numbers that say um, up to 25 microns between the um, inside faces of the, the cooling fins, which means that you got to have 10 micron or smaller particles to avoid accretion between them. Yep. Um, 
but on the um, compact heat exchangers that that can be potentially used in other areas, you know, it, it's a bigger number, but still it's a bigger concern than it is with the fin and tube style. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we have to, we um, socket, we're pretty close to the end here. <laughs> yeah, we have uh, just less than a minute remaining. Um, but I, th I think this was like good discussion and we can definitely continue um, in, a, in our next meeting. So um, at this point, um, I guess thank you for attending today's call and we'll see you next time. Yep. Appreciate it, everyone. Yep. Thank you. Hey, John, would you have Thanks. five minutes for me to give you a call? I do. Okay. Um, yeah, I do. I'll give all you a right. call. All Thanks. Right. Talk to you.